So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to divide this by verses. This side over here, the street side, you will read verse 1 and the odd number. You guys will respond with verse 2 and the, and the, ev and the even number verses. Everybody got that? All right, so don't be bashful. Let's hear you. <clears throat> Go ahead, folks, begin. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great life, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. Struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, his love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. To him who led his people through the desert, his love endures forever. Who struck down great kings, his love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, his love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, his love endures forever. An inheritance to his servant Israel, his love endures forever. To the one who remembered us in our lowest state, his love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies, his love endures forever. And who gives to every creature, his love endures Give thanks to the God of heaven, his love endures forever. Now please turn to Matthew chapter 14, which you will find on page 1520. Matthew chapter 14. Okay, page 1520, and we'll read the account, account of Jesus feeding 5,000. Matthew chapter 20 uh, contains two miracles of Jesus. The last three weeks we had three parables of Jesus. Now we're moving on to the miracles of Jesus. And the miracle today teaches us about the provision of God on several levels. But also in this account we see the very human side of Jesus. I'm going to point out at least three uh, actions. But we see the very human side of Jesus. And we remember he is true God, but also true man. And sometimes it's not easy for us to understand how those two divine and human natures interact in the person of Jesus. So we're going to do something different in this service. We're just going to read a portion of it to begin with and then move on. Okay? So let's read verse... The first part of verse 13. Would you join me? When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Let's stop there. So what had Jesus heard? You have to look at the preceding verses. Go ahead and do so. He heard about the death of John the baptizer. Now, John, of course, was a cousin of Jesus. He was about six months older than Jesus. And John was the last great prophet of the Old Covenant. His job was to 
prepare, baptize and prepare the way for the Messiah. And here, John is dead. And he died a brutal death. They decapitated him. Remember that story? If you look at those verses, who, who killed him? Herod. Herod. And what was the reason why Herod killed him? Well, no, he, say, he wanted to save face. It was his own pride. He had promised he'd give John the Baptist, and he didn't really want to do it, but he did it anyway to save face. His own, the reason was out of his own pride. So the question is, why? Why does John have to die this terrible death? Why wasn't there an earthquake? And the doors to the prison, the dungeon opened like happened in the book of Acts. Remember that? Why wasn't there an army of angels that came to save them and get them out of prison? Why, like Abraham and Isaac, wasn't there the angel who came and stopped the hand of the executioner from cutting off his head? The answer, we don't know. That's the reality. And you know, we ask these questions and the point of this is, the very human side of this is, how does Jesus respond to the news of John's death? He goes where? To a solitary place. So Jesus, in response to the sad news of John's death, removes himself with his disciples and he is in some kind of seclusion because he is what? grieving. Isn't that amazing? Our Lord, as true man, but also true God, takes this time to grieve the death of his cousin. Now, you know, we would say, well, why did it happen? Why didn't you stop it? Hey, that's, why, that's what we want. And I'm here to tell you that that's part of our issue in life. We in our very human nature, we also are taken back when we experience the loss and death of loved ones or others. It's the way we're built. And Jesus also as true man is built that way and we can relate to him. And there was no miraculous intervention. And so I want to say to you, first of all, that as we go through those things, we have to learn to give things up to God. And that is not easy. You know, we, we do want an answer to the why questions. And the reality is we're not going to find them. And sometimes I think to myself that the why questions are based upon an attitude at times that God did something wrong because we don't like what he allowed. And I want to say to you, we don't know the answer. And Jesus gives this up. He goes to a solitary place. And, and it appears he's grieving the death of John the Baptist. So that's number one, the very human side of Jesus. Let's move on. Let's finish out the first verse and then move on to the second. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed his sick. So here, picture the day. I mean, it's the day. It's been a tough day already. And now Jesus wants to be alone, if you will, with his disciples. And the crowd finds him. And he can't be alone. And instead of running away or whatever, he responds by what? Compassion on them. Matthew says he healed the sick. Mark adds he also taught them. So just think about this. So here our Lord is in his own grief. And now he is called upon by the needs of these hurting people and uh, ignorant people in many ways to the will of God. 
and he in his compassion takes the time to heal them and to teach them. Has that ever happened to you? The day was long, the emotions were tough, you were tired, and then there showed up someone in need. You ever have that happen to you? And you thought enough already. It's time to quit. It shows the compassion of our Lord Jesus. And I want to I point you to something because it also shows the provision of Jesus. There would be a time later in Jesus' life where his compassion would come to play again. And that was in the Garden of Gethsemane when they came to arrest him. The disciples tried to fight him off, but no. Jesus willingly goes. In front of the leadership of the day, he was ridiculed, he was beaten, he was slapped, he was mocked. He was flogged under Pontius Pilate, mostly in silence. And he walked down the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrow, with the crowds, quietly, and goes to the cross because of his compassion for mankind. And again, there was no miraculous earthquake that made those crosses fall down. There was no army of angels that came to rescue him and bring him down from the cross. He died as crucified, horrific death. But we know the answer to the why question in Jesus' death. And the answer is, in the resurrection we learned, through that sacrifice, he made the super abundant payment for the sins of all. In that one death was more than enough to save all mankind. Amen. 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 And we need to learn that. See, if you came from a background, and I just had this conversation with someone after the last service who has a relative who's old and dying, and he's scared to death that he's going to hell. And you know why? Because he doesn't think he's been good enough. There are a lot of folks who were raised with the idea, and I don't care what denomination is, let's, this is our sinful nature. Well, Jesus, yeah, he did something of it. But I've got to add to that. And that's wrong. That's not grace. And so many people are robbed, this young fellow said to me, about a relative. And they're robbed of the peace of forgiveness and salvation in their dying moments. I haven't been good enough, which actually says, Jesus... What you did wasn't good enough. It wasn't complete. I've got to add to it. And today, the point I want to say to you, if you struggle with that, I understand that. Because all of us do to a certain degree. But focus on the compassion of God. Jesus gives up his life as the super abundant sacrifice, not just for some but for all, there's more than enough redemption, salvation, and forgiveness through that one death and sacrifice for all mankind. And that should be our comfort, not our obedience, but his compassion for us. And by the way, every time we think we got to add to it, we're belittling the death of Jesus and minimalizing it. That's part two of the sermon. Let's finish it out. Let's read about the miracle. Verse 15, join me. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. 
Bring them here to me, he said. He directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. Looking up to heaven, he gave thanks, broke the loaves, then he gave them to Left over, the number of those who ate was about 5,000. Part three of the human side of Jesus. So it's the end of the day. It's past the dinner hour. And it's getting dark. And so the disciples do the considerate thing, don't they? They go to Jesus and say, send them away enough already you know think about the day this it appears all this happened in a day you hear have the bad news of probably the morning then you have the healing of the sick and the teaching and now here they are and they haven't gone home yet that's a, that's an interesting picture isn't it you ever have relatives that didn't know when to leave yes. <laughs> but they didn't go home yet here it is. Enough already. It's quitting time. Send them home. So at least let's do the considerate thing, right? The practical thing. And Jesus plays with the disciples. I think he did this quite a bit. He says, notice that verse, they don't need to go away. And I bet he had a big old smile, smirk. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And can you see the disciples? Their face was, what do you mean? This is ridiculous. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish. This is nothing. The, by the way, this is in all four Gospels, this miracle. And all four add a little new dimension to it. They argue with Jesus. And the reality is, I think Jesus is baiting them. He's messing with them. He's playing with them. Because he knows they can't do it. But he wants, he, this is called a, teachers, this is called a teachable moment. You betcha. When that kid's sitting at his desk and he can't figure out the math problem, and all of a sudden, ding, he has to work it through, that's a teachable moment. And Jesus is about to teach them. And what does he teach them? That he is true God. His power is not limited by the laws of physics and nature. No way five loaves and two fish can feed more than 5,000 people. And God, Jesus, is not limited. He is cre creator of the laws of nature. And that's what we have to learn. He is the provider. He is the, of not just enough, but more than enough. Why didn't Jesus just give enough? Why the 12 baskets? I mean, we would have said, well, just make enough. And then we'll, don't waste anything. Right? <laughs> why? The only answer I can think to that why question is because that's what God does. He's not cheap. God isn't cheap. You know, some people will give, this is what, this is what you're going to, this is what I'm going to give you. This is what you need. God always looks a little higher and he gives more. Have you learned that in your life? It's true in many, many ways. And we've got to learn that as well. You see, most of us, because of our sinful nature, we are minimalists. Especially if you're German or very pragmatic, you are, uh, this is what we can do. We can't do that. <laughs> this is what we can do because this is all we got. Correct? We are minimalists in the church. And we, church people, church people think this way. Oh, we can't do that. No, we can only do this. And we have to learn that God is not limited. And, you know, uh, that's, I think that's a problem in the kingdom of God because we're afraid. And we don't believe God can do this. I was interested in my reading for this, on this text. I can't believe how many professors, Christian professors, if you will, scholars, who deny this miracle. You know why? 
because they don't believe that it could be done. It must be a story. It must be fabricated. Well, would you want to believe in a God who is limited by, by the laws of physics? I mean, what's the point of God then? So I have an example for you today. A living example. Our Vacation Bible School mission offering. Back in January, Marlene, you know, we always start in January or December and look for a mission project for VBS. So we checked with the synod in the district. I even called my classmate, seminary classmate. He's the head. I hope I should put this on television. He's the head of the North American Mission Board because he wanted to do something in North America. Nada, right? Zero. So. Finally, I said, well, you know, we got this guy coming from Food for the Poor. You remember him? He came at the end of April and preached, Dr. Book, on Food for the Poor. Well, let's check them out and see what they have. So Marlene did so, and we went through a couple of things. We hooked up with a wonderful gal named Alexandria, Alexandra. Finally, finally, we found these these families in Nicaragua and the project to build homes and a community church center and school with running water in Nicaragua. We thought, sounds good. Well, so this year, this is the poster we had outside, this year I thought, well let's become really, let's become really ambitious. ambitious. Let's have faith. So I thought, look over here, our goal, our initial goal was 3,000. We had, have never had that goal in VBS ever, ever. 2,500 we were stuck at. So this year, we went for 3,000. Now our glory goal, if you see over there, our glory goal is 3,600. You can see the places where they live. 3,600. That would enable us to build one home. And evidently there's a bank or some place that will put matching money so we could build two homes. Here's what happened. The morning offerings of the children and staff almost reached $3,600. It was like at $3,558 or something like that. Almost. This year, which we have had minimally but this year was over overboard we had gifts ahead of time for the VBS mission then we had a memorial and I'm here to tell you today that we should be able with the matching to build four and on our way to five homes and I can't explain it but I do believe this is an example. See, some people would say, well, you were just lucky. It just all came together. Well, I'm not so sure. And it, it serves to me, and this is always an emotion, when on, on Friday morning, when we reached that, our, our, the number, and plus with the other money coming in from, from the silent auction, that we are able to send enough for four homes and on our way to five. So I want to say this to you. We think here. God thinks here. And we got to guard ourselves from being minimalist because God can provide. In Jesus' name, amen.